Buonasera a tutti sul canale, stasera abbiamo un'opportunità non indifferente, io ho la fortuna di intervistare uno dei membri fondatori del Neustirzende Neubauten, eh, come sempre io mi auguro che i sottotitoli arriveranno e di conseguenza però godetevi, se sapete un po' di inglese, questa qui è una conversazione che non tutti potranno fare, quindi eh, vi auguro una buona permanenza come sempre sul mio canale. Grazie a tutti. Mark? <laughs> I was trying to understand what you were saying, but I didn't get very far. <laughs> no, I said to my audience, this is the, an important conversation with uh, an important <laughs> musician for me. And I think so in my audience, uh, there are so many people who know Einstein Zende Neubauten. So thank oh. you for your time. I want to ask you the first thing. Uh, can you say to me the right pronunciation of uh, the band. <laughs> You're doing very well. Einstürzende Neubauten is good. Okay. Einstürzende Neubauten. It's easier for Italians than for English speaking people. Oh, okay. Okay. Mark, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything because I know you are very busy and you find the time to do this. So for me, it's a pleasure to do it. Mark. No, it's a pleasure. Uh, okay. okay. Mark, uh, let's talk about uh, your career. You're famous uh, because you're a founder with Blixa Bargeld about uh, Einstein Neubauten. But I want to ask you, your beginnings, uh, when uh, you pick up uh, an instrument and say, I will do the musician, what is your recollection and memories before uh, the Einstein Ah, oh, it's it's quite long. I probably I'm probably the oldest member in the band, or probably I was always a couple of years older. So um, before that, I can't go all the way back, but I remember. I think it must have been about 15 or 16. So late for a musician to start, but the um, a couple of years before Neubart and I joined 81. So yeah, so I was already in my 20s. Um, So uh, it was just, uh, I think, uh, I just always, you know, like most young people, I loved music and uh, I, I liked listening to it. And uh, it was the, well, I grew up more in the 70s, really. And um, there we, we had, uh, we were listening to different things, obviously, Pink Floyd and things like that. Okay. Um, so sometime at that point, I, I think I just thought it would be nice to play in a band. And I kind of... I always say the, uh, that bass players are very economically thinking people. Um, so I, I noticed <laughs> at the time that, um, that bass was actually not that difficult to play, much easier than guitars. And all the bands I knew were looking for bass players because everybody was playing guitar already. <laughs> so it so seemed a lot of <laughs> and, uh, and I have a bit of a Jamaican background. Uh, my, okay. my, the Chinese part of my family is uh, emigrated to the Caribbean. Uh, in the okay. middle of the 19th century. Um, so I, I always grew up with reggae music and, uh, and soul and funk from America as well. So, so uh, I, I always liked the bass anyway. And then reggae music, obviously, it's, it's a quite yeah. key instrument. Um, so I played in, in various bands before I joined Neubauten. Uh, not so many, but obviously what was a real um, influence was, was the emergence of punk which came to Germany a bit later than, than in the UK, more the end of the 70s. So I was in a few punk bands and a few punk-driven projects. And um, I actually played in a, in a reggae rock band for a couple of years where we actually toured Italy a little bit. And um, we weren't very good, though, I have to say. <laughs> we, we, I remember we were in a, in a tiny club in Hamburg and... I think there were about eight people. With, we heard that there was a band playing that also were mixing rock and reggae music. And we went there and it was the police. And they yes. were playing in this tiny club with, I don't know, maybe eight other people. And uh, they were pretty amazing at that time. I mean, you know, they were really, Sting was still very young. And uh, you know, Copeland is obviously an amazing drummer. And, um, and we were quite blown away. And I think we realized after that that Uh, the rock reggae thing had already developed further than we were aware as a band. <laughs> so, uh, but that was even, that was before, that must have been in the mid 70s, something like that. So, um, <coughs> so music's been with me for a while. And um, yeah, 
I'll let you ask some questions in between, otherwise yes. I'll talk non-stop. Yes, no, 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 it's better because I want to to let you speak about it. I think that <clears throat> in those days, uh, you talk about uh, the commission about punk and reggae, but I think that uh, there are so many different uh, genre like ska music specials, but uh, in your point of view, I think that, uh, I think that uh, in uh, your background, uh, there was, uh, in my opinion, and uh, when I listen yes, to them, know about them, the, um, the smell of uh, crowd rock. Is it right or <laughs> not? Uh, I, I loved, I listened a lot to Ken, Tago Mago, and, uh, and yes, um, and as I said, I, I grew up musically more in the 70s, and crowd rock was big then, from Brazil yes. Machine to uh, well, Ken were were uh, were a very absolutely favorite band. I, I love Ken, so yes, that is that is present, I suppose. But I think but, that um, uh, in the crowd rock, uh, because you born in England, but uh, you came to Germany in, in the early days. I think that uh, yes, in the in the sixties, more or less. Yeah. Okay, so you are German. You are uh, English German. And I think that uh, when you join Yesterday Neubauten, what is your uh, memories of uh, the first met with uh, Blixa? Where do you meet uh, him? In, in Berlin? Uh, no, actually in Hamburg. We, um, the, as, as I said, we were, you know, we were very much part of, of the local punk scene. I don't know how, how punk developed in Italy, but in, <coughs> in Germany it was really... Uh, a quite had a quite strong youth cultural impact you know we, we were um, already it was quite political there and um, uh, a lot of my friends were in were organized or were less organized but we were anarchists basically but we were working on things like alternative economy so things tied together with with music the, the do-it-yourself spirit um, fit in very well with the the fact that we weren't interested in taking normal jobs and doing things like that. We were always looking for other ways to to survive and make money. And suddenly, music had become something that we could that we could do. Uh, my partner later in Prybank ran the uh, one of the first uh, independent record distributions and a, and a record shop, obviously called Ripoff. And uh, and the all the the punk band I played with at that time, Upwards, we all worked there. And, uh, and we actually made a living out of it. So there was a there was a scene, um, and everybody was very active. Um, there were regular concerts in in Hamburg, uh, organized by a guy called Alfred Hilsberg, who's unfortunately not in a good shape at the moment, but was quite influential at that time. And he would organize festivals, um, inviting a lot of German bands then as well, because um, you know it was. You know, English punk was always maybe a little bit more about fashion, and yes. um, you came from a fashion background yes. as well. And, yes. and when it started in Germany, yeah, we had we had bands who thought they were the UK subs and were trying to sing in English and play exactly like the English bands. But very quickly in Germany, it became more of a conceptual approach. You know, we and and it obviously exploded when people started singing in in German in their own language. Maybe in in a way like how hip hop has now become very influential in the world. Because it's obviously very different if you can tell your own stories in your own in your own language and you're understood by it by your peers. I mean, like like in Italy, probably hardly anybody in Germany understood or still now understands English lyrics. But um, that had a that had a pretty profound impact, and and the result was that we had uh, scenes in you know Germany is very decentralized, and Berlin was always that that time especially still uh, very much of an island, a bit far off and actually not very big. And Hamburg, Düsseldorf, Frankfurt, um, Hanover, Cologne, um, all these cities had local punk scenes. Munich was the exception. I don't know, Munich punks somehow were, were a bit strange than everybody else's view. It was more of a <laughs> disco right. city, more Giorgio Moroder. And, yes, and, uh, <laughs> more disco, more disco, yeah. more electronic yeah. stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, so uh, out of that punk scene, there, there was quite a quite a lively concert scene, and Alfred would put on together actually with with my partner Klaus sometimes uh, kind of festivals or evenings in Markthalle where eight or ten bands would play sometimes with a couple of English guests, but mostly out of from Germany, and um, 
the, the Hamburg punks were very, very dogmatic and conservative uh, for some reason. They, 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 you know, they, they all wore the black leather jackets and the, the spots and stripes, uh, you know, the, the metal studs and all that, uh, which was fine, but they were also quite, they didn't like what they felt were art students taking away, messing around with their music. Um, which, you know, in, from Düsseldorf, if you look at Der Plan or uh, Atatak and things like that, um, okay. you know, I, I can see wh where they were coming from. And Anschutz and Neubauten played and they were just totally strange for the for the audience there. It was uh, very early gigs, was only, they were only three at that time, Alex and <clears throat> Andrew and, and Blixer. And it was, uh, I, I know I was there and Mufti was, was in the same punk band and we thought they were fantastic. And pretty much, well, a large part of the Hamburg audience thought they were terrible, and this was an insult. <laughs> and started throwing beer bottles, and well, what was done at the time. Um, so the concert had to be had to be postponed, and and what was agreed is, um, uh, we I think we were actually the headliner with with Abwärts, the the punk band there. Um, so we said, look, we'll play first, and why don't you play after us? Then, you know, because people wanted to see uh, a more standard punk band. And uh, and we figured once we played, then everybody could go who didn't want to see other things, and then who would stay could watch Anschluss and know about. And that's I think that's what we did at the time, um, because we, we thought they were great, and and that seemed the right thing to do. And um, so I saw them. I saw Blixer on stage first, and uh, I I didn't have so much. Mufti stayed in close touch. I think he went to Berlin with them, and he started working with them. And then uh, what happened is when they started recording Collapse, they called me and, and said, they, uh, well, I'd like to come down. And I joined essentially to play on the, on the title track on Collapse. So that was my start on the band. So, Tanz de Biele. Uh, Tanz de Biele. <laughs> yeah. Tanz de Biele Actually, I remember was, uh... on, I was experimenting with, with sequences at the time. So I brought down a, a C, an ARP sequencer set, and I thought maybe this is good mixing electronics with Einschitz and all that, and quickly came to the solution that no, it is not <laughs> at that time. It didn't really make sense, but I, I think I played a pretty mechanic, um, mechanic and repetitive crowd rocky uh, line on, on Collapse. And after that, frankly, we were, we were kind of, uh, there were two long discussions. I, I kind of, whenever they recorded, uh, uh, we, we joined. I joined, and when there were when live gigs were was fa fairly understood. There was no big ceremonious introduction to the band. I was with the band from then on. I think that uh, you said uh, about uh, collapse. Collapse for me, it's uh, the best um, the best example for the birth of uh, the industrial music. I want to ask you, in those days, nineteen eighty one. And you talk about uh, UK. In the UK, there were some bands like Cabaret Voltaire. It's totally different for me, for the industrial. I want mm -hmm. to ask you, um, Frobring Grizzler, I don't like so much. I, I prefer, but uh, I don't want to stay in this way. I, I prefer the Neubauten for my reasons. Uh, I, I think about... Um, the aesthetic of the, the thing. But uh, Fabric Lisa was very fashion, fashionable yeah. in the sense of the industrial. I want to ask you, um, in those days, uh, have you ever been uh, in tour with Fabric Lisa or uh, have you ever been met uh, in tour? Uh, talk about uh, with this band like uh, from Grizzle, for example, or, or SPK from the, for the uh, Australian uh, Music, the uh, Zende was uh, outside this uh, circle of uh, musician or are inside uh, these um, people? Yeah, it, it, it changed over time, obviously. In, in the 80s in, in Berlin and Hamburg, um, Throbbing Grissel were probably the, on, the only band that we really respected. We, we liked their conceptual approach, not so much the individual songs, but they, we felt they were doing interesting things. And um, uh, we later, we met Cabaret Voltaire because they were on the Some Bizarre label as well, who were nice guys, but, but it was music that we found interesting. But uh, Throbbing Grizzles were probably the only band we thought 
we were fo kind of following and, and when something came out we were checking it out and, and thought well, you know, that we, we were quite impressed with them uh, i don't know if you know but but uh, i still publish genesis who's who's unfortunately died, passed away a couple of years back but but the um actually we had an ongoing relationship uh, after that because we were on the same label in the uk for a while on the crazy some bizarre label um with with psychic tv in the in the later okay. form and yeah, i know okay. chris and Cody from uh, that time and and we worked with coil as well actually i published coil for a while as well coil, um, yes. so we were we were friends but that came later really that came after uh we'd we'd gone to london and had a deal in london which was about 83 and in london we we met all, all the english bands obviously we met cabaret voltaire and uh well and mark almond who was on everybody was on some bizarre because we were sale, okay our office um soft cell yeah and again you know mark was really lovely and they were uh, very friendly and and uh, i think they were quite i don't know he was he was as a person he was he was fantastic musically it was very far away obviously but uh Robin Grissel were probably musically the maybe the the closest be, maybe because of their approach to music i would say i think that uh probably listen in my op opinion was a good band but uh, in this uh, in this time, uh, I think that the SPK. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah the, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, totally yeah, different uh, from the others. Totally different. Yeah. Very extreme. Very oh. crazy people. What was what was the name of of the singer again? The singer was um, is it alive? Graham Revell. Ah, great. He front, did film uh, music afterwards. He's done a lot of film music, hasn't he? Yes, he uh, yeah, is yeah. a um, uh, soundtrack uh, soundtrack musician in mm -hmm. very in very popular films. But uh, I think that um, the, the SPK with uh, Einstein Zende was a uh, was a bomb because uh, they used so many cacophony like yeah, Einstein Zende. But I think that in those days, the Einstein Zende was uh, the new, the news of uh, the music uh, in 1981, if you think about uh, Collapso or, or the second uh, 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 album that I, that I don't speak uh, so well, German, I don't know. Yeah, drawing, drawing the Voltaire was, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, I think what what um, why I, I was fascinated and why I enjoyed working with Norbon, one of the things that was new for us is that, you know, we got into the studio for the first time for, for Collapse. And and we used, we, I can't really say, well, for various reasons, we, we treated the studio like an instrument in itself, uh, which was, um, which we enjoyed a lot and which gave, you know, new possibilities. It was like a huge, another instrument. Yes. in which uh, which we didn't know and couldn't really handle but but i know that um i must say with, with hindsight the owner of the studio the hafenklang studio was was actually pretty cool habit boom i think is his name um and because at some point we were do, doing all these crazy things you know record trying to record all kinds of things and doing th things that you should not be doing later on we also like cut up the big two inch tapes and so you know we, we experimented a lot and um what at some point he just handed us the keys because we were staying up all night anyway and he was kind of he was the studio owner and he was the engineer in the beginning and then, then we were doing it ourselves in the end he just gave us the keys and he just said look you know don't break too much and you know call me when you're finished essentially so we spent many hours there uh, experimenting some things more productive than others but it was you know we were trying to i don't know we were trying to, re to record switching off the studio which was quite difficult because once you switched it off you couldn't record anymore obviously so so we had some crazy ideas but that approach really stayed and that also stayed you know uh, at some point um Obviously, we felt that we needed to get out of Germany. It was a bit both economically and, and artistically. And uh, and we, Jim Thurwell, a friend who came over, who had a project called Fetus, um, he introduced us to, to Steve-O at Some Bizarre and to Daniel Miller at Mute Records. Okay. And Steve-O, with whom the band has a very difficult relationship for economical reasons mainly. But the um, at the time, 
uh, he had signed soft sell and he was uh, he was a millionaire and he was 16 years old and uh, he couldn't read or write actually he was a bit of a yeah. crazy guy yeah. but he loved Neubauten maybe for all the wrong reasons but he um, but he, he uh, essentially he gave us access to the Trident studio which is uh, at that time is a state-of-the-art studio where in London everybody recorded very expensive and essentially we had lockout there we, we essentially we were in the studio day and night and did whatever we wanted and okay. uh, and that's how drawings of ot was recorded so um the use the usage of the studio was was something that that i think set us what not other i, I didn't other bands were kind of different they were partly because we never rehearsed so we came in there and then we started from scratch so um so i think yeah well then, but i think most other bands didn't see the studio that way it was more they had their songs rehearsed they went there to record them as authentically as possible and and then do things you know at the time in any case in this point of view your uh, your opinion about the use of the studio like an instrument uh, is like the <clears throat> thoughts of Brian Eno Brian Eno was the same uh, the, the mm -hmm. same point of view to use the <clears throat> the recording studio like a synthesizer like a guitar like a drum and not so mm -hmm. many bands uh, do like this but mm -hmm. i think that uh, it, it, uh, if uh, i think uh, from collapse um, through the through the he, he, um, through the classic years of the i i i think that uh, in 1985 with albert mensch the change um, there was a change because if i listen to yugung yugung was a huge it uh, with a flavor of uh, sorry if if i say that uh, like a disco rhythm but uh, it's totally different mm -hmm. if i think that albert mensch i see on youtube uh, there is uh, a, re, um, a, a, a classic recorded by a japanese uh, director can you recall yeah uh, yes a film yes mm -hmm. And in those days, you are uh, you 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 were bold without uh, any kind of uh, of uh, classic air, and it yeah, was I think I shaved change. my head in Japan, yes, something like yeah. that. But in uh, in those days, uh, in the Albert Mensch days, uh, the um, the decision to do this video video tour, it is. Uh, very different from the other bands. And with uh, Albert Mensch, can you recall uh, the recording process uh, of uh, this album? Um, actually, not so much because it was not so different from recording of other albums before. I think, you know, we were, again, it was also, we were using, you know, we, we built the choir through a lot of multi-tracking. Um, so there, it was, nothing was, I don't think anything existed before we went into the studio there. Most of it was improvised in the studio and, and then recorded there. Um, but I, I must admit the, uh, uh, the, the memory is a bit hazy on some of these things. Yes. After all these years, some things flow into each other. So, because the, for a while, the studio sessions were kind of the same, uh, you know, the same approach. We would go in, we'd try things out, we'd, then something would develop, and and then it would go further. But um, I, I remember at the time, I, I, I'm really sorry. I'm my, uh, no, no, which no, year no problem. Was it, released? was it 85? 80, when, when did Have Image come out? You, you probably 1985. Have it was yeah, the yeah. year of my birth. Ah, okay, there we go. I think we toured Japan a couple of times around then as well. We, we quite we liked Japan, and um, and were approached by. Uh, I think the label suggested that we do something with Sugu Ishii, who'd done um, completely different work as well. He'd done more comedy films almost, but he had an interesting. We liked his his work, so it felt like a good idea, and, and we did have a great time actually working with him. Um, yes, but I, I don't know so much about the record. Obviously, no, I remember, no, no, no. remember more actually the 
um, what we did because the music was very present while we were in Japan working on the film because the film was okay. based on the tour and that was the the current album. So um, obviously we we met Biako Shah, the the, um, the dancers, and and uh, we played the songs from the album. I think we played a lot of them live in a factory hall, and that was the yes, base of the. Yes, it film. was in a factory. It was in a factory. Yeah. But but they had I think the songs actually had existed before I think it was live recordings of an existing album that's where I'm that's why I, actually now that I think about it, that's why I remember more recording the live versions in Japan in, in the context of the <laughs> film but I think we actually had already recorded at least part of it in the studio before um, which we you know it was a, re a live re-recording essentially okay if I remember correctly and uh, in uh, the same. Here there was a another recording. Uh, is called uh, I, 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 um, I don't remember. It is called the autobahn. Was a strange uh, connection of music. Uh, in this case, was very very industrial. If you mm -hmm. see the video, I don't know if if you see the video on YouTube. And it is no, a yeah. Okay. With autobahn, obviously think of Kraftwerk. But no, 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 no. It's it a film. The, the name, and yes, it is a ah, recorder of the Asturzende, and it yeah. is very, very industrial with some metals. Uh, you play the bass. Uh, the, oh, the bass. I, I remember, oh, I, I think. Sorry, now I remember. It, it was a yes. We played on a on a bridge on an autobahn bridge. Yes, is that what you meant? Yes, yes, that was with um, with a, a TV producer actually. Um, uh, yes, I remember now. Okay, sorry, I I, I wasn't no, sure no. what you meant. Uh, it's it, it was a recording on an autobahn bridge actually, but I, was that the title or I, I'm not sure if, if it was. Um, yes, that was that was also a live concert. We had fun, <laughs> pretty much alive. But we were working with backing tapes then already as well. So, okay. so some of okay. it comes from a tape, and some of it is. I know Mufti, Mufti chose to to dig a hole as his instrument. Obviously, that didn't produce so much sound. So yes, because in the, in the center point of the video, there was uh, I think that it was uh, uh, another member. I think that it was um, Mufti. I think that it is digging in the in the. Uh, in the street and i don't understand the thing but it is very very strange but for me it is a a, a classic sound of the instrument uh, with the yes. vocals of blixa the classic shout of blixa yeah. like a cat uh, yeah. like a cat uh, those were live. he was he, he was playing those live and i think we were using we were using vanadio meeting a backing track of of time Warped recordings of uh, of uh, a whole set of um, well metal tools uh, screw I don't know what they're called really but yeah I, I, I remember now uh, so it was it was partly improvised partly backing tape but but not a rhythmic backing I think maybe later on rhythmic backing tape but the the singing was all live and, and yes like uh, like the same uh, <clears throat> like the classic Blixa voice. I want to ask you um, the aesthetic of the band. You you later said ab about the, the fashion. The fashion for the I I to Zend Bauten was not so important because if I see because if 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 I see your clothes your clothes are very normal. There's no so many fashion. I think that your clothes your suits. With uh, classic, uh, it is very yeah. classic. Not like so the Blixa with the chains uh, and the leather and the ah. strange, uh, <laughs> strange hair like yes. mine with the with the. <laughs> I, I and 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 I want to ask you, fashion for you in those days are uh, important or not so much. I think not as important as it was for for you know for for, the, for English bands or but but for Germans fashion is generally not as important as it is for English people maybe and and French maybe Italian as well but the um 
at yeah, I thought Blixer had a had a very cool look, and it was obviously it was kind of it had a you know a bondage element, and and he had a lot of hair uh, tackered to his his uh, faux leather uh, vests and stuff. I, th I thought he looked great, um, it, but it, I think it would have been a bit funny or quite boring if we all had adopted that look. <laughs> what looked yes. like that. <laughs> he and Andrew at least had the same kind of haircuts, but Andrew always had a very uh, how do you say Idi idiosyncratic? I think is the word. He would he would dress in in a very specific way, lots of rubber and things like that. And we we you know we all came from different backgrounds, um, so uh, yeah, I, I I liked suits. I I thought it was um, I started wearing suits when I was a punk because I thought it was just kind of the most contrarian. It seemed the most contrarian thing to wear in a punk concert to have a proper suit. And um, I ruined a lot of suits on, on stage, that's true. But uh, yeah, uh, and it, it's just, for me, it felt fine to continue wearing suits on stage, yes. So in that sense, but not as not so much as a fashion statement. Um, I, I, I do think Blixer had, had, a, had a closer connection to fashion, but more in the sense that, that he had, he, he thought a lot about style and, and things that he would do, or, which I think he still does. I think he's no. all into. I think he now actually is into suits as well now. Actually, no, no, no. Yes, <laughs> he has a lot no. of tailored tailored suits. <laughs> yes, now he used uh, from ten years uh, when I saw in Milan uh, so many years ago, tailor suits. Uh, it is very yeah. different now. He used the the, vo the, the voice uh, in another way because I yeah. think that uh, he thinks about uh, he grow a, a little bit. Uh, more older than uh, <laughs> when the collapse days, but Mark, yeah, uh, you know that well, uh, there's a there's an anguish and and there's you know when obviously there, there are things that are when you're young you you obviously you have a you have a different what well, a different feeling to the world and to your own life. Yes, uh, I quite I, I like the work that that Plexa does these days. I, I think it's it's quite I think he's matured quite well in a way, but like. Like good, a good country musician who can, or blues musician who can. Yes, who can he, um, I think that uh, it was the the nearest uh, collaboration with uh, Nick Cave. I think that uh, Blixa change when uh, come to the Nick ba the Nick Cave band, and for me it was uh, a very important change from the Astur Zend. And I want to ask you, why did you left uh, the the band? Why did you leave? Uh, sorry. You know, I I had um, well, I played with the band for eleven years. I have to oh, no, fourteen years, I think. No, fourteen years. I joined in eighty one, and I left in ninety five. And um, I had kind of I I become the manager of the band to um, you know. By default, a little bit, and um, we used to have a manager, but Blixer fired him and felt that I can do that, <laughs> which which wasn't so. But I did enjoy that. I've always, um, you know, I, I come from a Chinese family. We're very business oriented. I, I okay. have quite a business oriented family, and um, and as I said, for me, the there was the music and and the uh, if you want to call it business or the economics of it were were not not a contradiction they were very much part of it I, I thought part of the attraction of punk was that it, it created on what we would have called an alternative economy or a, you know it, it gave us the, that is what really what gave us the liberty to to be fairly free in our in our artistic decisions that we had financial in, in independence so it was quite I, I did see that as part of my role in the band to make sure as well as I could that it was financially independent and that we could live off it and we were not, we didn't have to do a radio hit to, to survive. And fortunately that, that worked quite well, partly because we, uh, we discovered publishing, which to us was like the dark arts at the time. And I think not many people, not many bands understood publishing. And, um, I think it started, we had the initial start was that when we signed with some bizarre, uh, the label wanted to have our publishing rights as well. And I already was enough of a business person to say, well, 
uh, no, we, your, your label, we're not going to give you the publishing. <laughs> That's a different business. And, uh, and it went for a long time and, and it was a long, long discussion. And in the end, as it got, as one should, or as one often does, we agreed a compromise that we would uh, put the Neubart and Songs into a publishing company that I would administer, but that um, the label could use for their own publishing adventures or, or whatever. So, so we set that up and, and from then on, we published our own, our own works. Um, and we were very ambitious about it, actually. I, um, I, you know, I looked at publishing at the time and it was, um, and still is, but then even more so, it's a very slow and very antiquated business with a lot of people uh, taking a share who don't really make any contribution. And um, and so we took the approach that we would do this all differently, and in the in the spirit of um, of independence and maybe uh, a youthful exuberance, we underestimated the amount of work that is involved in doing it. So we joined all the societies directly. We didn't want any sub publishers, so we became members of PRS and of Gema and of Sasam in France and Harry Fox Agency in America and JazzRack in Japan. We became direct members in all the collection societies because we wanted to get the money directly from them. And you always have, you know, obviously money gets lost if you if it goes through too many hands. And um, that was a bit ambitious because you can do that. And it's an idea that later companies like Hobart picked up many years later. But if you only do it for one band, it's uh, it is an enormous amount of work for, for because you have to register that every song you do with eight societies and and it's all multiples and it's um, so at some point and funnily enough because a lot of the friends we had um, at the time also didn't really know what to do with publishing and when they heard we were doing our own publishing uh, we were actually approached from Fetus and Coil that's that's how we we ended up publishing them actually that they said, you know, oh, you're doing publishing. Why don't you do our publishing? So it actually, without having been that much of a plan, it became a publishing company that was not only working for Anschutz and Neugarten. And, um, and I quite enjoyed that. And, um, and for me, uh, at some point it became very difficult to do both because I could see that, that there was a, it made, it would have made sense to, to develop the publishing company, but you can't really, develop a company you know an independent company without any money really we didn't have any any fine any capital um when you then go on tour for three months or you, then you're in the studio for three months so i always felt i wasn't doing it as well as i could and it was also the other way around when i was in the studio um, i remember it being in, in connie plank's studio and, and trying to play a, a bass line and i could see the fax machine at the back of the studio and i could see a contract coming out of that and I, I just noticed how it was distracting me from being a musician because it's a very different, it's a very different mindset doing business and doing music. And I, I, I felt for some years or quite a few years, I felt I could manage it, but I, I by breaking it down into periods. So I would, when I was on tour or, or with a band or recording, I would not touch any business, and um, you know I would do something to to create a break from from the other time. But it got more and more difficult to do both, and I got the for me personally, I got the feeling that I I wasn't being as good a musician as I as I could be if I would focus fully on that, um, because business in that sense was a distraction, um, and also I had a company already with a few people actually working there already, but uh, I was on the road too much really to to get it done. So at some point I felt I needed and I wanted to make a decision to do. Um, you know, because it just felt like I wasn't doing either of it properly or as well as I could. And uh, and like most people, it's you want to have the feeling that you're doing things as well as you can. At okay. least I do. So okay. so I had to make a decision. And, and in a way, uh, at that point, then I thought, okay, I've done the music. I've been a musician now for 14 years in Neubauten. And before that, five or six years with other bands. So I've done almost 20 years of my life as a musician. Um, maybe now I'll, I'll do. I'll have a look on the other side of the business, and um, yeah. And so I decided. And uh, but it was a very amicable. I, I told the band much a year before that that I had that plan, and we we looked together at what was a good time. And I think the last project we did was a was theater music in in Berlin in Potsdam, uh, for a for a um, 
the Faust variation by, by Werner Schwab. And that was that was fun and, and nice to do, and it, it was a nice end project. And obviously, uh, I I actually went on. I, I'm still the publisher of Einstein and Neubaum, so we are okay. still in contact, and I handle their publishing and. I sent Blixer his accountings, <laughs> do all these things. So you work, for, for outside, me, uh, you work outside the Einsturzend Neubauten, but you're still here uh, with your spirit inside the band. I think that I, I love the band, and I, I go to every concert I can go to. And, and as I said, I, I still am I, I'm their publisher, and I, I take that quite serious. I, I, I do I try to do what I can as a publisher. I'm not their manager anymore, but um. But the you know I, I enjoy publishing because it's it's a great way to work with artists. Um, with your and, experience, with your experience, like a musician, you translate uh, your experience of a musician inside uh, the business management. So you work uh, for the for the for the band, and uh, I <clears throat> I know that uh, you are uh, you are a chief uh, of uh, free bank. Uh, publishing your mm -hmm. uh, your company i think that yeah yeah that's right and the, um, yes sorry no no that's fine I, that is correct it's um i always felt it was it was it's it's good to well i think it's it's helpful for me and, and maybe it's it's helpful for musicians that we work with as well that, that you know it's i i can understand i think i can understand Maybe a bit better than than people who've never been a musician. What what's important for, for a musician? Things like that. It, it is very important uh, in my opinion. I am a, a musician now, but uh, not yeah, a professional. <laughs> not a pro uh, not a professional. But but I think that if you in the past uh, you um, you was a, a a classic musician, maybe you can understand uh, the classic. Uh, job of the business uh, of the businessman because uh, you stay in touch with the company with uh, the record company so in your case uh, it is a classic translator from the past uh, to the future and mm -hmm. i want to say that <clears throat> i don't want uh, to to waste uh, your time but uh, i will send uh, the uh one two three four five five songs of my the later band but we don't play and uh, in the in the classic way so i will send you and i want to yes. and yeah, i okay. want to have uh, a point of view from the master of the i to zend neubauten <laughs> mark it is a pleasure to talk with you thank you for your time yeah. thank you for everything i will send you via email the songs okay. maybe i think uh, we've uh, we transfer or uh, send me the classic browser when you send uh, so huge uh, files and tell me what you think about it yeah 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 we transfer it works that's easy okay mark okay. thank you for your time thank, thank you, you for everything that's and for your music no thank you that's bye that's mark always... thank you take care bye 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 bye